Phantom Retrospective presents Das Phantom der Oper, Lost in Time. Universal's Phantom of the Opera, starring Lon Chaney, has achieved legendary status and is heralded as the most faithful adaptation of Gaston LaRue's work. But did you know there was an adaptation released nine years earlier that was seemingly even more faithful than the final release of the Chaney version? Just like Dracula had in Nosferatu, Phantom had an unauthorized version in Germany. Unfortunately, unlike Nosferatu, the 1916 silent film Das Phantom der Oper, directed by Ernst Matre, has not survived, and indeed, very few even references to it exist. Director and actor Ernst Matre, born Erno Siblat, was born in Budapest, Hungary on May 27, 1891. By the time of the film's development, he was 24 years old. In addition to directing the film, Matre portrayed Raoul. It appears that both before and after he did some acting in stage productions. Seemingly, this is the first known directing role for him, though it's worth noting that a very unfortunate percentage of silent films are lost and may not even have documentation that survives. His father was in ill health around this time and in the next couple years died. Matre went on to do more films after this as an actor and later choreography and dance director, continuing as late as about 1950. Notably, he served as dance director for the 1939 adaptation of The Hunchback of Notre Dame, directed by William Dietl, and the 1941 adaptation of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, directed by Victor Fleming. He appears to have had more than one marriage. Correspondence from 1952 to 1953 makes mention of a Maria Matre that he was married to at this time. He later wrote of his wife having an affair around 1958 to 1959, though it's unclear if the two parted at this time and for that reason. He met his second wife, Elizabeth McKinley, who would appear to be a journalist, perhaps for the LA Times, sometime between then and around 1969. Finding no references to work after 1947, one can surmise that he retired around that time. He would have been 56 at the time. Not much else seems to be known about his later years, other than the fact that he and his wife Elizabeth traveled to Tokyo in 1970 for the World's Fair, the first to ever be held in Japan and Asia as a whole. He passed away eight years later on November 12, 1978, in Los Angeles, California. Actor and director Niels Olaf Chrysander, born Waldemar Olaf Chrysander, was born on February 14, 1884, in Stockholm, Sweden. At the time he portrayed Eric, he was a relative newcomer to the industry. His first film releasing only a year before Das Phantom der Oper would at about the age of 31. He continued to act and direct in the years following, including notably in 1917 when he starred opposite Polish film actress Pola Negri in Nicht lange tauschte mich das Gluck. After directing a few films in Germany, he moved to the United States, where he directed Fighting Love as well as The Heart Thief, both released in 1927 and survive to this day. Not much seems to be known of his life following this, but at some point after 1930, he went back to his home country of Sweden, where he died in Skorup in 1947 at the age of 63. Actress, director, and producer Odegede Nissen was born on May 30, 1893, in Bergen, Norway. She began acting on the stage in her home country in 1911 at about 18 years old and had her film debut two years later with Bjorn Bjornsson's Senensborn. Following that, she moved to Denmark to work for Dania Biofilm Kompagni, a production company in Denmark. She worked there until she moved to Germany at Bjorn Bjornsson's invitation, as the German film industry exploded two years later. German filmgoers saw her as Christine Daillet. In 1917, she and her husband Georg Alexander started their own production company, Egede Nissen Film Co., where she acted as artistic and financial manager, while her husband directed most of the films. In only two years, the company produced 27 films, only to close following World War I, at least in part due to the centralization of the German film industry. In the years that followed, she appeared worked in films with very notable German directors, including including Ernst Lubitsch, Fritz Lang, F. W. Murnau, Karl Grun, and Gerhard Lamprecht. Like many silent film stars, her career did not extend into the era of talkie films, though she did later appear in two films in Norway released in 1941 and 1942. 
Prior to rediscovery of these materials in the 21st century by users of a classic horror film forum, it was not entirely certain this film was any more than a myth, perhaps fitting for the Phantom. John Flynn has claimed in the 2006 edition of his book, Phantoms of the Opera, The Face Behind the Mask, that a copy of some sort existed. However, he has received much criticism for this book, having many errors, thus is not a credible source. The earliest known reference to the film was the February 1916 issue of a German film magazine titled Lichtbild Bühne. The article on page 210 appears to be early reporting on the film that does not reveal much info other than production is underway. There is also a promotional poster later in the issue. The March 1916 issue contained another poster. Payman's film Listen, an Austrian trade publication in its 19th issue, contains a synopsis of the story, which a user on the forum mentioned earlier has translated to English. It's worth noting that the table has a misprint where the columns listing the length of the film and number of acts that causes them to be out of alignment by one. Thus, the numbers on the bottom are the correct ones for Das Phantom der Oper. The synopsis is as follows. Fantastic drama with Aud Egedenissen. During the construction of an opera house, its designer had installed various mechanical and technological contrivances that ensured he could secretly access the rooms in the cellar. One day, illness prevents the diva from appearing as Gretchen in Faust, and the designer, in the guise of an old regular visitor to the opera, known by the name Phantom, recommends an ingenue to the director to take her place. A recommendation the director accepts, the ingenue's appearance proves a success only for her to then find herself held captive in the underground rooms by the ugly Phantom, who is in love with her. She is rescued by her fiancé and a Persian, while the master builder meets with his death. The subject matter is good, and the photography acting and sets very good. From April 14th to the 21st of 1916, Das Phantom de Oper was shown in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, as Het Spook in de Opera. It was advertised as being approximately an hour and a half long, and notably gave credit to Gaston Leroux, despite all other advertising for the film not acknowledging the author. This would later be seen again with Dutch marketing for unauthorized adaptations of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, as well as Dracula crediting the original authors. Austrian trade journal Kinematographische published an issue dated May 14, 1916, that includes an even more detailed synopsis to the film. What follows is again an English translation from a user of the forum. This effective film possesses a certain originality as a result of its fantastic and mysterious subject, for which there is ultimately a rational explanation. Of particular note are the superb images shot, in accordance with the mysterious subject matter, using gloomy lighting, which prove extremely impressive. Faust is scheduled for performance today at the Big Opera House. However, the establishment's director receives a letter signed only Phantom, advising him that if the singer Carlotta should become indisposed, then Christine ought to take her place. The communication leaves the director with an uneasy feeling, as all previous prophecies by this spectre of the premises have come true, and indeed, he soon holds a letter from Carlotta in his hands, informing him that she is unable to perform. He rushes to Christine and begs her to take on the role, something she's only too pleased to do. Her appearance proves an unrivaled success. In a semi-conscious state, the singer makes her way to her dressing room, but the doctor who is called explains that her nerves are merely overwrought. Count Raoul Chagny, a keen friend of Christine, waits outside her dressing room for the doctor's departure and is bemused to hear a man's voice in the dressing room after the doctor has left. After Christine has also left, he sneaks into the dressing room, but nobody is there. At the post-performance party... Christine is introduced to Dagora, a Persian who is the opera's oldest regular patron. Raoul is also present at the party and takes Christine home in his car. When he asks whose voice he had heard in her dressing room, she winces and pleads with him not to question her about this now, promising instead to explain all to him later. Raoul declares himself satisfied with this and hopes to pay Christine a visit the following afternoon. The next day, however, he learns from Christine's mother that she has gone away at short notice. His unease increases that evening when a friend tells him he's repeatedly seen Christine being driven about in a stranger's carriage recently. 
After stepping out for a breath of fresh air at his friend's suggestion, Raoul sees Christine with his own eyes, in the company of a gentleman in a passing carriage. He cries out, whereupon the stranger impels the horses to gallop, and the carriage is soon out of sight. The following day, Raoul receives a written invitation from Christine to meet him in the reception room of the Opera House, and this time she turns up promptly at the appointed hour. However, she swiftly whisks him away from the realm of trapdoors and stage flaps, and up to the highest point on the building's roof, so that they will not be eavesdropped on. Here she begins to relate her tale. One day in her dressing room, she heard wonderful singing that seemed to be coming through the wall, and a voice then said, I want to teach you if you will dedicate yourself to me. From that day forth she continued to hear the disembodied voice, and she made great progress with her singing, making possible her recent great success. But while hearing the voice in her dressing room anew, the large mirror on the wall had suddenly slid upwards, and she had found herself drawn into a dark room where a masked man stood before her. In shock, she fainted, and when she came round again, she was in the deepest underground recesses of the opera house. The masked man stood opposite her and said that no harm would befall her, but that she should never ask him to remove his mask. He disappeared into a side room, and suddenly she could hear the familiar, wonderful singing once again. Entering the room, she saw the masked man seated at an organ. The urge to behold the stranger's face overwhelmed her, and she tore off his mask. Horrified, she recoiled as a skull. The phantom of the opera grinned back at her. "'Now you can see my hideous ugliness!' he cried out beside himself. "'And now you shall flee from me as all people do, but I love you and never want to let you go. Promise me you'll stay with me!' She decided to feign sympathy toward him in order to secure her freedom. It moved him to the core to have another human being look at his face, and she in turn felt genuine compassion for him also. He promised to allow her to leave for now. If only she would return to him again, she gave him her word, and so he brought her up to the surface realm. But tomorrow was the date that she'd promised to return to him always. Raoul told her that following tomorrow's performance he'd take her far away to safety. But the phantom had eavesdropped on their every word, and during the following day's performance, the auditorium suddenly went dark, with the lights coming back on to reveal that Christine had vanished. Great agitation filled the opera house, with the lighting technician immediately discovered to have been chloroformed in the electrical room. The Persian thereupon approached Raoul, telling him, This is the phantom's work, but I can lead you to her. And so he led Raoul down into the underground section of the building until the pair reached the phantom's dwelling place. However, the phantom had watched their approach and now set a mechanism in operation that caused the two to drop into a small room. So long as Christine continues with her vehement refusal to be his, the phantom keeps on raising the temperature of a special furnace, causing the walls of the room in which the two men are sealed to begin to glow red hot. After much searching, the Persian locates a spring-loaded mechanism, and by pushing against it, he succeeds in creating an opening through which the two men can escape. They hurry to find Christine. A faulty pressure switch in the boiler room heating the furnace causes an explosion, in which the phantom perishes. Finally, the Persian explains that the Phantom had been the original designer of the opera house, who, shunned and spurned by people on account of his ugliness, holed up here, consumed with hatred at a fate that left him abandoned by the world. The latest known contemporary reference is in the April 1917 issue of Lichtbild Bühn, where it is listed among the top films of the 1916 to 1917 season, and that is all that is known of Das Phantom der Oper, lost in time but not forgotten.